Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrew Samwick, and I'm the director of the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center here at Dartmouth College. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this year's Thurlow M. Gordon Lecture. Thurlow Gordon was a member of the Dartmouth class of 1906, who, soon after graduating as valedictorian and earning his law degree at Harvard, made his way in the nascent field of antitrust law. By the time of his retirement, he was widely regarded as one of the nation's foremost experts in that important field. The Rockefeller Center sponsors the Thurlow Gordon Lecture each year to bring to campus leading thinkers and practitioners in emerging fields of law in the present day. We are grateful to have with us Mr. Tom Barnico, a member of the Dartmouth class of 1977 and currently the Assistant Attorney General for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Since 1981, Mr. Barnico has represented the Commonwealth and its officers in civil cases involving constitutional law, general administrative law, and business regulation. He's argued three cases in the United States Supreme Court, 19 cases in the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit, and 70 cases in the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. Mr. Barnico has been the director of the Attorney General Clinical Program at the Boston College Law School since 1989, where he earlier earned his law degree. Prior to beginning his career in the Attorney General's office, he served for a year as an assistant district attorney in Essex County, Massachusetts. The title of today's lecture is World Trade and States' Rights, New Threats to Sovereignty. On matters of international trade, the United States Constitution favors the interests of the federal government over those of individual states. But in a federal system, individual states may have competing interests with those of the federal government. This competition has intensified in recent decades as the policy-making process for international trade agreements has become more concentrated in the federal executive branch, and the number of such agreements has grown considerably. Supporters of this evolving system claim that the agreements carefully balance the free trade benefits with labor, environmental, and other regulatory interests of nations that are parties to the agreements. But many individual states within the United States claim that trade agreements unduly restrict or preempt their state laws regarding commerce. Mr. Barnico has been at the center of legal cases that focus on the privileges of states to protect their sovereign interests in the area of international trade. We are fortunate to be able to learn from his experience to better understand law and international trade. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Thomas Barnico. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Samwick. Thanks also to Sadna Hall and Sarah Morgan of the Rockefeller Center for arranging this lecture. It is an honor to deliver the Thurlow Gordon Class of 1906 lecture. It's a pleasure to be back in Hanover and at a podium here. In my day job in court, I get a podium, but I'm constantly interrupted by uh, people in black robes. So I'm very pleased to have the floor, at least for a few minutes uh, today. I must note at the outset that I speak only for myself today and not the office of the Attorney General. My lecture today stems from ideas that I first encountered here as a student. Uh, I studied American government, constitutional history, political philosophy with uh, fine professors like Vincent Starzinger and Richard Winters. I became very interested in constitutional law, the separation of powers, and the allocation of power in a federal system. I was not aware at that time that a lawyer could make a living handling the lawsuits that uh, present these issues in state and federal court. Uh, in Professor Arthur Wilson's seminar on American political thought, I must have overlooked Tocqueville's line, that is the rare public question in America that does not end up in the courts. Somewhat by chance, I discovered the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office and the small group of lawyers who handle such cases. McCullough v. Maryland, Lochner v. New York, Roe v. Wade. These cases, which I know are known to you, have at least one common denominator of which you might not be aware, and that is they're all handled by an assistant attorney general or a lawyer handling a similar role, uh, arguing a constitutional question in the United States Supreme Court. And uh, once I discovered that, um, 30 years passed uh, qu very quickly. 
It's only been in the last 10 years of my practice that I've been involved in the intersection of state laws and international trade agreements. And that intersection is my topic today. I've chosen a very broad topic, but hope to bring it closer to your lives um, with three examples. Here's the first. You are a student concerned with human rights around the world. You study abroad and learn of human rights abuses in a particular country. You haunt the New Hampshire legislature and ultimately convince it to pass a bill that requires the state of New Hampshire to boycott companies doing business with the abusive regime. You even get your New Hampshire congressional delegation to push and pass a federal bill permitting such boycotts. Your motto for your campaign is, we will live free of such tainted goods and services or die. On the day after your state and federal bills pass, the Daily Dartmouth reports that Japan and the EU, who are major trading partners with the abusive regime, have cited the New Hampshire law and trade complaints at the WTO, the World Trade Organization. You ask yourself, since when? Second example, you are a resident of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, interested in the environment. Your coastal city is proposed as the site of a new LNG port facility by a foreign company. You check state and federal law and conclude that state and local officials can play a significant role in the siting decision. You think that you might be able to convince the federal government to deny the permit. You are therefore surprised to learn that the General Agreement on Trade and Services uh, may be modified to support a complaint by the company on the ground that the denial of the permit is not the least restrictive measure that would reduce, address safety concerns. You ask yourself, since when? Third example, you are a businessman in New Hampshire promoting state subsidies for new businesses. You meet with interested legislators and discuss your ideas. You propose to limit the subsidies to New Hampshire, or at least United States-owned businesses. The New Hampshire AA Assistant Attorney General, present at the meeting, endorses these measures under the U.S. Constitution on the ground that the domestic and foreign commerce clauses do not restrict subsidies, only discriminatory taxes and regulations. At the close of the meeting, however, as you step outside and view Webster's statue outside the New Hampshire State House, the Assistant Attorney General adds, of course, we have no way of knowing whether these subsidies will be challenged by a Canadian firm or the Government of Canada under NAFTA. You ask him, since when? The title of this lecture today is World Trade and States' Rights, New Threats to Sovereignty. My reference to states' rights is to the allocation of power between the federal and state governments under the United States Constitution. The questions I pose today are first, whether the new generation of international trade agreements has altered our division of power in some way. And second, if so, whether that change is something we need to address. First, some constitutional background. Uh, we know that the framers of our Constitution in 1787 were worried about their experience under the Articles of Confederation. They were worried about the troubles that were caused by some of the states in their relations with foreign states. Um, there were good reasons why the framers in 1787 denied to the states specific powers such as the right to declare war, to enter treaties, tax imports. Um, we also know as part of our constitutional system that the Congress has power to nullify state laws uh, through the Supremacy Clause when they deem those state laws to be inconsistent with national goals. That's a power to enact federal legislation um, and accomplish preemption in that way. Yet, finally, as part of the structure, we also know that they reserve broad powers to the states, often called police powers, to regulate in the public interest to uh, matters uh, that were considered local at that time. Of course, one of the more recent developments is it, it's, it's an uh, uncommon action now by a state that doesn't carry at least some impact nationally or internationally, particularly in the regulation of commerce. So this is the, the, our existing constitutional backdrop that I'm using as context to consider the effect of the new generation of trade agreements and their impact on state laws. <coughs> now, international trade agreements have existed for many years. 
These often concern tariffs on imports and laws that discriminated against foreign goods at a port or border. The number of these agreements, however, have grown recently, uh, and the United States has entered in a new round of agreements, particularly the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT, and the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, and a number of bilateral agreements. As Professor Samwick pointed out, the proponents claim that these agreements reasonably balance uh, interest in free trade and other regulatory concerns, such as labor concerns or environmental concerns. However, through the last 10 years or so, the states of the United States have alleged that the trade agreements unduly restrict and potentially preempt state regulatory authority and state rules for subsidies and procurement. States have also objected to the exposure created by provisions that authorize challenges to state laws by private companies, such as uh, that right under NAFTA. State attorneys general play three roles in addressing these issues. They submit comments to Congress as each new trade agreement is proposed. They advise their governors and legislatures on proposed agreements on potential effects of such state laws. And when litigation arises, they participate in international arbitration under agreements such as NAFTA and GATT um, and any related litigation in the United States courts. Attorney General advice might be critical when the United States trade representatives solicit from the states agreements to be bound by the latest round of international agreements. Uh, states may advise governor to exercise caution or even decline entry of such a commitment. The problem procedurally at the state level is the United States trade representative tends to conduct business with the representatives of state government who are in charge of trade policy, such as export promotion and trade trips and all the things that you would associate with a state's promotion of its own exports. Those state offices, however, are not familiar with these issues of federalism that I've raised. Uh, they, are, have a different, they have a different mission, and they can't really be expected to be watching out for the prerogatives that states have as to their own lawmaking authority. Um, and a further danger arises when the United States Trade Representative, in soliciting the states for some agreement to a new international commitment deals only with the executive branch of state government. Uh, entry or expression of a commitment to these new trade agreements could entail the overriding or the suspension of existing state law. Now, under most state constitutions, that's a prerogative that rests with the legislature alone to repeal a state law. And so existing framework in which the United States Trade Representative at the federal level ask a state governor to uh, commit to a trade agreement could have create a tension under the state constitution as to who has the lawmaking authority. So you can begin to see that the, the issues that are presented and how state officials need to pay attention to the not only the proposing but the implementation of the new trade agreements. Some of the states have um, come you know, quickly to the realization that some attention needs to be paid at the state level. And they've created processes like requiring state trade offices to give notice to the legislature or the attorney general of a new round of trade consultations. Uh, but, but there are continuing problems with this framework as the United States Trade Representative deals with. Um, consultation at the state level. So those are some of the procedural problems. Uh, the substantive problems arise, uh, as you heard in the introduction. The states are concerned that laws that they might pass, whether they be, in my examples, a boycott, um, an environmental regulation, or third, the subsidy, which American constitutional lawyers would con all consider to be constitutional under the United States Constitution, 
are at risk of challenge under the trade agreement because there are provisions in those agreements that are more restrictive. And, and that's the substantive problem is that the state constitution may commit to the state legislature and the governor certain rights uh, of regulation and taxation or support of business, all of which would pass muster as a matter of American constitutional law, are now at least at risk of being challenged under the trade agreements. And it, my brief today really is that's rather new, rather important, and something people who study trade, government, and all the rest need to consider that impact. Um, for Massachusetts, that hasn't been only hypothetical. Uh, we've had a couple of instances where our laws were challenged under these agreements. Uh, the first had to do with our boycott of companies doing business with Burma in the late 90s, which led to complaints filed by the European Union and Japan uh, claiming that such a law violates the, what's known as the Agreement on Government Procurement. It's part of GATT, and according to those complaints, it would prohibit a state from applying a non-economic factor, as it's known in the trade business, but rather a political factor to their choice of purchases. Um, the second example involved in Massachusetts arose when our state Supreme Court decided a case involving a Canadian developer. <clears throat> the case was decided adversely to the Canadian developer. Um, and since it only involved matters of state law, there would be no grounds for review by the United States Supreme Court. Um, most lawyers and citizens would look at the matter as concluded at that point. Instead, the case was the subject of a complaint under NAFTA by the Canadian firm claiming that its rights to substantial justice were denied by the judgments of the Massachusetts courts. The, the case involved um, rather, a, I, I have to use the word spectacle, of, of uh, retired judges and law professors submitting affidavits to the NAFTA tribunal supportive or critical of the decision of the Massachusetts courts on the questions of state law. Um, the Chief Justice of Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, learning of the arbitration, expressed concerns in a newspaper article about the case rather shocked to learn that the decision of the state's highest court on a question of state law could then be the subject of an after tribunal. The case uh, was one, uh, but uh, the example remains that the concerns I'm raising aren't merely hypothetical, and there are examples in other states. You know, it's not something that you see in the papers every day. Uh, in a way, this lecture is about the part of the iceberg that's under the water. Um, and not the tip. The tip is still rather small. Um, but the, certainly the trend is toward international trade and international agreements of all types, not just on trade. And my point is rather we should start working through this question of federalism and state authority earlier rather than later before things heat up. Um, so to repeat, to give these substantive examples of what has uh, been arising, three types of litigation. Uh, the one I mentioned regarding uh, NAFTA, the case brought against the WTO involving the Burma boycott. And then um, still another variation is the constitutional litigation against the Burma boycott itself. That case, although it was brought in the United States court and looked like a traditional case that business might bring against a state, uh, was supported by the, the complaints under the trade laws. That is, businesses claiming that a state government was violating the United States Constitution, such as the Foreign Commerce Clause, cited the fact of the trade complaints as evidence that the state was um, interfering with the operation of foreign policy. So this, the intersection then of the trade laws together with our own constitutional law created another example <coughs> of uh, the type of impact that I'm discussing. 
I'd like to uh, turn now to uh, how these remedies play out when somebody complains about a state law under these trade agreements. Um, and some of the students of political science might be interested in how this uh, plays out. When a foreign country complains about a, a state law, the foreign country can lobby the United States to persuade the state to repeal state law. None of that is very lawyerly or litigation related. It's all a matter of job owning and, and lobbying. Um, if the United States can't convince the state to back down, then the United States could make a compensatory trade concession to the complaining country. Failing that, the, the, the complaining country could invoke uh, what I referred to earlier regarding the Burma law, invoke the provisions in the trade agreement to bring the state, for example, to the World Trade Organization for uh, a decision. Now under federal law, if that happened, the state law is defended by the United States State Department. So unlike the cases in constitutional courts in the United States or federal court where the Attorney General would be in charge of the defense of that case, the lawyer for the state, so to speak, is the United States Trade Representative and or the, specifically um, the Department of State and the litigators there. Um, that poses some interesting questions of political science. The, the, use, the, the United States Trade Representative main mission is to promote trade by the United States. They may not have the same interests as the state in protecting state regulatory authority. Um, I mean, at worst, they might quietly hope that the state law falls um, just so that it is removed from the docket. In the cases to date, they have mounted a defense and successful in, in certain cases. Um, but um, it remains an anomaly I think created by this new world I'm describing that the state law that's challenged under these trade agreements is actually defended by the federal government which may not have exactly the same interest. Um, of course, when, when Congress has approved these actions, they, they have provided some protections. Foreign countries and companies can't sue the states in our own federal court system. The federal government could sue us in federal court and make claims that we're inconsistent with the trade agreement. So too Congress could act in each of these instances I'm describing to pass a federal law that would nullify the state law. But as you can see from those two examples, political stakes would be much higher uh, when uh, Congress takes a vote to nullify the type of state law that I'm mentioning or the President directs the Attorney General of the United States to bring a suit in United States District Court to accomplish that result. That was, would be significant political choices. They would ri risk significant political capital. Um, but from the state's point of view, they would be more consistent with the existing structure we have, which is that you know, in matters touching on foreign affairs, just as Professor Samick pointed out, the, the presumption certainly runs with the federal government. So the, the fact that Congress would preempt us from enacting a law that touches us on foreign affairs, or the president, executive branch, would sue a state over such a matter, while that might be a dramatic political step, it would be a traditional step in the way in which we usually work these things out in the United States. Um, so, but in terms of procedure and remedies, I, again, I think I can identify anomalies and certainly new developments um, that present uh, issues each time the United States considers entry of a new trade agreement. Um, these, uh, so these procedures and their pitfalls provoke you know, more questions. First, in their consideration and implementation of trade agreements, will Congress and the executive branch adequately protect state lawmaking authority? Second, 
Is there a process that would give the states a more effective role in the negotiation and implementation of trade agreements? To date, the states really have been limited to advisory roles. Um, we can jawbone the United States trade representative uh, over the negotiation of the new agreements. There are advisory committees set up to perform that function. Of course, we can always lobby Congress as well when the new agreements are presented by USTR to or in the President to Congress. Um, none of these to date have pr provided a, what you'd call a, a strong voice, let alone you know, real power over the process. So people who study these things um, more, more than I do have proposed various ways to tweak that process to give the states more of a say o over the trade agreements and provide greater protection for the state laws. Um, all of the proposals, though, do, do suffer from the, the problem that they look like Band-Aids. They, they look more like uh, stop gap. None of them are conferring any real political power uh, as uh, a block to what might be considered the more dangerous of the provisions. That's led people to think further about what could be done. And in some sense, that leads me back now to the start because it's back to the Constitution and from, is the source of, of, of one of the proposals. And, and then eventually from the Constitution I'll end up back here in Hanover uh, because it turns out former President John Dickey thought a lot about this problem um, well before trade agreements became as prevalent as they are now. As to the Constitution, I want to focus on the Treaty Clause. The Constitution vests the power to make treaties in the President and the Senate. The President may make treaties by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, provided two-thirds of the Senators present concur. The Constitution gives the House no role in this process. Representation in the Senate is by state, by equal representation, not proportional representation. So I think it's fair to say that the Senate is designed as a body that was to look out for the interests of the states as states. That is, their interest as lawmaking bodies with a degree of sovereignty preserved by the Constitution. Now currently, these trade agreements that I've been referring to uh, are enacted by a majority vote of the House and Senate and signed by the President. They're not submitted to the Senate as treaties. They're submitted as bills, just as you are familiar with. And they are sometimes known as congressional executive agreements in, in the sense that there's concurrence by both houses and support by the president. Constitutional lawyers will look at this and say, well, it's trade, so it's commerce, so perhaps that's an exercise of Congress's power under the Commerce Clause, uh, Foreign Commerce Clause, uh, to enact a bill and to have the President sign it and give it legal effect in that respect. Others object to this process on the ground that international trade agreements are treaties subject to the, the Treaty Clause, that these are compacts, international dimension of a sufficient gravity, significance to fall within the meaning of the word treaty that's in the Constitution. Um, there's been no resolution of this question politically or judicially. Um, GAFTA, uh, NAFTA and GATT came on the scene in the 90s. There were congressional hearings at the time about this issue um, to no conclusion. Um, there have been plenty of further debates, many articles, um, everybody's suffering under the, the problem. I think that the, the treaty clause was, the treaty isn't defined in the Constitution and it, it, it is a, a, a slippery effort to enact a definition that 
would distinguish between the more significant of international agreements on the one hand and more uh, everyday matters of, of foreign relations. <clears throat> so that's where things stand. We have these agreements that are submitted just as bills that you would be familiar with and enacted on that basis. Um, the, the treaty clause, though, is of interest because, as I pointed out, if, if the purpose of the two-thirds vote was to provide some greater protection for the states as states, then that's the role I've really been describing here. I've been describing a uh, power of the states, you know, sometimes known as a sovereign power or power of regulation, was preserved by the 1787 document and under which the states regulate you know, business within their borders. Um, could it be that, in other words, it, that there is a procedural check here that's actually in the document, that we don't need to talk further about new advisory commissions or new procedures by which the state might be better protected, that the answer may lie in the Constitution itself. Uh, it's in the two-thirds vote. A minority of the states sufficiently concerned with their sovereign authority and, it, and the impact of trade agreements on that authority could block by, because a supermajority is required for um, approval. <clears throat> That's the consideration. That's the kind of tantalizing answer to this question of process and substance that the, the states have posed. And that brings me to John Dickey, former president of Dartmouth, uh, 1945 to the early 70s. John Dickey was concerned about actions by democratic bodies that hindered an effective foreign policy. As a young lawyer, he worked for the State Department um, and saw close at hand um, the difficulties in implementing American foreign policy. In 1988, Professor Gene Lyons and the Dickey Center published a paper, which I have here, uh, describing President Dickey's, quote, lifelong interest in studying the strengths and weaknesses of the Constitution in enabling the United States government to confront the troubles of the world effectively. Professor Lyons showed that John Dickey was very concerned about the effects of the Treaty Clause on the conduct of foreign policy. Dickey had taken part in the struggle to enact the Trade Agreements Act of 1934 and the in the defeat of the proposal for the World Court in 1935. He thought that the executive should be able to act by executive agreement and a majority approval in both houses rather than under the two-third requirement of the Treaty Clause, so that he, he envisioned a more effective American foreign policy in the event that the President could submit to the House and Senate and have enacted by a majority vote the, the proposal. He saw the Treaty Clause as a block. He thought that the Constitution should be amended to create a role for both houses of Congress and allow approval upon majority votes. He was particularly interested in the role of the House uh, because as closer to the people, he thought popular support for the latest foreign policy initiative could be uh, enhanced by giving the House a role and giving the members of the House a role in the matter. He published um, an article on this in Foreign Affairs Journal uh, on exactly uh, this, this subject, taking exactly this position. Now, all that has left me feeling very daunted um, because my modest thought about the Treaty Clause seems to run headlong into what John Dickey thought about the Treaty Clause. And um, that gives me a lot of pause. Um, he was sort of an oracle in my house. He, um, he was the in his freshman year as president, when my father was a freshman here. And so I grew up in a house where if John Dickey said something, it was correct. Um, in fact, when I was here 
he had retired as president, but he was still teaching his seminar on Canadian-American relations. And I think at the time I was threatened with economic sanctions if I didn't take uh, that seminar. So I took that seminar and I learned at first hand uh, about the warmth and greatness of that man. Um, but that's not helping me today because if John Dickey thought that the two-thirds requirement was, um, he was quoting John Hay, but he thought it was the irreparable mistake of the Constitution of 1787, um, that gives uh, me some pause. What would he think about expanding the use of the Treaty Clause to promote um, the role of the states in the formulation of at least trade policy? <clears throat> well, it all may not be lost because he might have seen the Treaty Clause at least the same way that I'm positing. Um, one passage in this article in Foreign Affairs states, the treaty procedure was confined to the Senate exclusively because the treaty power was viewed as a right and concern of states, not of people. And accordingly, the founders sought not a democracy of the people in treaty making, but rather a continuation of the power in that body where the then sovereign conscious states were represented equally. Well, that sounds a little bit like um, what I mentioned about the, the role of the Senate and the role of the states and, and the link to the two-thirds requirement. Now, he had plenty of concern about what he called minority sectional vetoes over its national interests and international policy. So he, he very much saw that, that as a danger to the implementation of what he thought to be wise international policy. But Maybe the trade agreements today pose questions of states' rights and federalism that weren't present exactly in, in the post-World War II era uh, in the 50s which, where he was writing. <clears throat> the other thing interesting about the Dickey article is that he seems to assume that an amendment to the Constitution is going to be necessary in order to carry out significant international compacts by mere majority votes of the House and Senate. That, that suggests he was doubtful that you could do that kind of thing under the current Constitution. So that gives me, makes me wonder whether he would think that a trade agreement of the significance of NAFTA or GATT could be enacted by majority vote rather than through the Treaty Clause. He wouldn't be happy that the Treaty Clause w might be necessary, but he might agree that under existing arrangements um, it, it was necessary, absent an amendment. <clears throat> so, um, where do we go from here? Are, are the states simply on the wrong side of history? Uh, states have been on the wrong side of history before. Um, does the benefit of applying the Treaty Clause to help the states outweigh the costs to its use identified by John Dickey? Maybe, maybe not. I, I turn now to uh, another alumnus of Dartmouth, Professor Ernest Young, a law professor at Duke, class of 1990. Pondering similar problems, he says, it, it may be that giving the states a meaningful voice is simply incompatible with effective action on the international plane. But he also says, and I think this really sums up where we are and where we should be as we leave today, uh, Ernie Young also says, these shifts have occurred, meaning shift in allocation of power, shift in the exposure of states to foreign complaints of this type, these shifts have occurred without anything approaching, quote, constitutional politics in this country. That is, the kind of fundamental public debate that would allow us to accept these changes with our eyes open. Young continues, our debates about NAFTA and the WTO have been debates about the economic merits of free trade. 
No one has made clear to the public the sort of powers to invalidate important social policies that has been delegated to a supranational institution. Well, my purpose today has been to open eyes and further the debate, and I thank you for the time. Thank you for coming. Questions? Um, it's not clear to me, but uh, based on what you said, but I'm wondering of, about our, uh, the occurrence of a, of a, let's say, a big multinational treaty, let's say, on climate control or something. Um, could uh, could we include? Could a Congress include, or the USTR include, words which would say? that uh, passage or signing, uh, passage of a bill to approve this treaty would uh, include negation of any contravening state laws and uh, would prohibit the subsequent passage of any state laws uh, that would be uh, contra to this treaty. I don't understand law very well, but I'm, I'm wondering whether such a thing could has ever been tried or if it hasn't why not I couldn't quite tell whether that last part was to preserve state law or nullify it nullify, nullify. well I think it would be making even more express you know the dangers I've described in a way it's more transparent isn't it yeah. that yeah uh, and in a way it's it's exactly, it's what the, the states have, uh, political, uh, absolutely. Before a big blow up takes place. A absolutely, it would be making more transparent, it would be opening the eyes, as Professor Young put it, if the document being voted on clearly intended you know, to override state laws, or more clearly intended, rather than have the current arrangement, whereby a very broad s statement in a trade agreement like, you know, substantial justice, um, you could be used later as a ground to nullify, say, a state court decision. Um, I, I think Professor Young would would su support that because it would uh, trigger the kind of debate he he's looking for uh, with a more transparent discussion of, of the preemption that's intended. Um, this example I gave you of the Massachusetts law, uh, or the Massachusetts decision by the state court, challenged by a Canadian company, senators remarked about that case after the fact, and a similar case in Mississippi, and said, we had no idea you know, that Chapter 11 of NAFTA could be used in that way. Um, so that, that's quite the opposite of the transparency and quite o the opposite of the nullification you're mentioning. So um, I don't expect that anytime soon. There's a much higher political cost to push a trade agreement that is so express, right? Well, I'm thinking of one that affects every citizen directly, you know, like a client. Right. Right, and one would think that that would, in and of itself, lead to closer inspection you know, of, of the provisions, um, even beyond those who feel that such a treaty would negate existing state laws regarding the environment. So something of that magnitude could provoke the debate that we, we think is, is healthy, but the states. And, I'm not, I speak as if I'm speaking for all of them. But those who 
wonder about this new generation of agreements and those who wonder about their effects on state laws. About the case that you just were talking about with the Canadian company, um, was the case resolved uh, on substantive grounds or was it uh, resolved by deference to the Massachusetts state court decision and the maybe preclusive effect of that ruling? I'd say the former. I, and the proceedings didn't show much deference, hence my reference to the spectacle of the competing uh, submissions criticizing the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court for its ruling on Massachusetts law, which, you know, those of us who've been around that court for a while thought was, you know, bordering on the comic. Those, are, those would be questions, now that I, I, I hope this isn't too much legal inside baseball, but those would be questions that the United States Supreme Court would have no jurisdiction over because they would be state law questions, not federal questions. So maybe I should dramatize that more. So I think the answer is to start, they did, the arbitrators under NAFTA decided under the terms of NAFTA that there wasn't uh, you know, a violation, which was, I don't mean to be, uh, we shouldn't be uh, not, uh, ungrateful you know, for, for that. But, um, and the states have won some of these matters. Uh, but I don't think it's, the, and the deference certainly isn't required. Yeah. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on the, uh, the Burma uh, boycott in Massachusetts. And I'd like to for, uh, ask you this hypothetical. Um, suppose the United States, on the grounds of national security, says Iran is a very dangerous regime, and we need to uh, have an embargo against Iran. But the state of Massachusetts says, hey, we don't have a problem with Ahmadinejad we should be able to trade freely with them. I mean, is, the, is that sort of the opposite of what the Burma case was, where Massachusetts unilaterally decides to boycott uh, certain countries' goods? Um, well, in that respect, it's the opposite in terms of support rather than uh, boycott. And it's not likely it would have it wouldn't have had the economic effect that led the EU and Japan to complain about the boycott. Um, as a matter of American constitutional law, uh, it, it might not have brought a lawsuit or would bring a lawsuit against us simply for the fact that it sounds like you're talking about an expression you know, rather than something with economic teeth. Um, it, it probably wouldn't please somebody, you know, in the State Department, j just like the Burma law did not. But, uh, and this is rather, I know this sounds rather legalistic, but the, it, just the expression of that view by, say, resolution might not get a state into trouble. In the oral argument of the Burma case, Justices Kennedy and, Kennedy and Souter were wondering about what about just a proclamation or a resolution? Does that have a different footing under the U.S. Constitution when you're in this area? As opposed to a law with a force of law that has economic effects, you know, like a boycott. Uh, but for those who criticize generally the role of the states touching on any kind of foreign affairs, they'd be probably as concerned with the, you know, that statement as its opposite. Um, yeah. I think we probably haven't seen the last of uh, cases in our own courts where a state law that touches on foreign commerce or foreign affairs might be influenced by trade complaints. It, it, it was a pretty effective strategy in the case challenging the Burma law. And the opinion of the United States Supreme Court in the 
case regarding the Burma law cited the EU and the Japan, Japanese complaints. And it made for a very difficult position when your position at the state is, in, is that whatever disturbance, you know, in the conduct of the foreign relations of the United States it's, should, should be ignored by the court. That's a tougher spot to be in when these complaints had preceded the filing of the lawsuit. So I haven't focused on that today, but I, I see that as another way in which th these worlds are intersecting. Um, and that whatever existed as a box in which you would litigate American, Christian American constitutional law are going to feel more and more pressure from international regimes of law, international bodies, complaints of this type, more requests in United States courts that international law be enforced in deciding American law questions. Uh, today I'm working on a very small subset of that overall problem, um, but that's where the trend is going to be. So same article by Professor Young, he, he jokes as he is wont to do, it's uh, something in the air in Hanover. It, you know, just makes for good humored people. And Ernie Young's no exception, and he's wondering, well, I've spent all this time learning about constitutional law and federal courts and state sovereignty, and now I'm being forced to learn a lot about <laughs> international matters, that these, the boxes aren't going to be as neat as they used to be. He, he's got to talk more to international law experts if he's going to continue to study the Constitution of the United States and its operation. Um, that's another place where these things get tied up that I've been discussing. So, yes? Um, you haven't been exactly unequivocal about your <coughs> assessment of whether or not the sovereignty problem is as harmful as, um, is very harmful or not. So I, I would like to ask whether you could make an argument whether, about whether um, this unified front, I guess, of all the states following the same treaty uh, under the federal government will be a good thing, as opposed to, I guess, this erosion of state so sovereignty. Um, you know, I'm going to pass on that. I'm gonna just, it's a little bit outside my job description. The, the point is more that the ultimate decision makers who remain, the, you know, the federal officials ought to take that those interests more into account? And is there a procedure by which we can do that? I, I can detail for you the, some of the effects so far. Um, I can agree that, you know, they're interests of the states and they're important and they ought to be respected and taken into account. But as for, you know, you know, each successive treaty as it should be voted up or down, or the, the question that Dickey posed really as to whether anything like that should stand in the way of what the federal decision makers um, think is important. I, I don't really feel as strongly about that, or, or expert enough to decide whether on balance, you know, the agreements are still a good idea for the United States. You'll find plenty of people willing to uh, give you an opinion on that. Uh, a lot of people feel very strongly about those sides of the question. There's just this little corner of the world that I work in about the constitutional law as it h is handles the states in our system that I'm reporting to you that there's something about the trade agreements that's new in that little corner. So how's that to, for a dodge on that? Pretty good? Right. Right. Well, thank you very much.